This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So first we'll play a video. Okay. So uh, we'll discuss about a little about uh, cestodes. Then we can uh, go move on to the actual PPT. Uh, so please watch the video right now. Ma'am, the video is not audible, ma'am. Video is not audible? Yes, ma'am. Is it audible now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, one second, I'll start from the beginning, okay? So even though it's the largest tapeworm, there's little to know about it. 
The last thing what we're going to talk about is echococcus granulosus. Echococcus granulosus is transmitted to us humans by the ingestion of eggs and food that is contaminated with dog feces. It's also nice to know that sheep are intermediate hosts. Echococcus granulosus can lead to the formation of hydatid cysts in the liver, which are described to have eggshell calcification, and it's usually detected on CT scan. It's worth mentioning that the contents of the cyst can lead to anaphylaxis if the cyst ruptures for whatever reason. For the treatment of echococcus granulosus, we use albendazole. Next, we're going to talk about trematodes or flukes. We'll be talking about schistosoma and clonorchis sinensis. Starting with schistosoma, it's important to differentiate between three species of schistosoma, which are schistosoma mansoni, schistosoma hematobium, and schistosoma japonica. We use their eggs to differentiate between them. So, schistosoma mansoni egg has a lateral spine, whereas schistosoma hematobium has a terminal one. And lastly, japonica does not have a spine. For schistosoma transmission, it's transmitted when the circaria penetrate bare skin in fresh water, for example, when swimming in a contaminated water. Also, it's worth to mention that the intermediate hosts for schistosoma are snails. Now, for the clinical significance, just try to remember this. Schistosoma mansoni and japonicum affect the GI tract, causing intestinal schistosomiasis, while schistosoma hematobium affects the urogenital tract, leading to urinary schistosomiasis. Schistosoma mansoni can also cause liver and spleen enlargement, fibrosis, inflammation, and portal hypertension. So they're all related to the GI tract. On the other hand, schistosoma hematobium can cause squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. In addition, it can cause pulmonary hypertension compared to portal hypertension in mansoni. Now for the treatment, we can also use praziquantil to fight these worms. The last one we're going to be talking about today is Clonorchis sinensis. The name looks a bit scary, and so does the character, but don't worry, it's easy to remember. It's transmitted by consuming undercooked fish, and once this happens, it can lead to biliary tract infection and conceitful bleeding to the gallstones. It's also associated with phalangiocarcinoma, or cancer of the biliary tract. Lastly, for the treatment, can you guess what drug we use? You're right, it's surprising fun. Okay, to summarize again, here's the classification of parasites. We talked previously about protozoa. Today, we started talking about helminths, and we divided them into two groups, platyhelminths and nematodes. Platyhelminths were us the target of today's review, and they were further divided into two subgroups, cystodes and trematodes. Next video, we will talk about nematodes. Finally, we hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know what you like or dislike about our videos in general, and about this video in specific, so we can improve the next video. Okay. So am I audible now? Hello? Hello? Ma'am. Yeah, is it audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now we'll go to the PPT. Basically, today's class is about echinococcus and hymenolepis. But as uh, we saw in the video, we'll just summarize what uh, you have learned before and then we'll move on to the actual organisms. Okay. So, helminthology basically, you have seen that parasites are basically protozoa or helminths. Okay. So, helminths are basically platyhelminths or nematelmins that is platyhelmins are those flat worms okay these are flat so that is why platy so just now he told that plate so from that it is platy okay whereas nematelmins are round worms okay nematodes they are basically nematodes so these platyhelmins are basically uh, of two types one is trematodes and cestodes trematodes are flukes or leaf like worms they'll be shaped like a leaf exactly they'll be flat They'll have a broad, uh, in, they'll be broad in the center and they'll be tapered at both ends. So those are trematodes. Whereas cestodes are tapeworms. Why they're named as tapeworms? Because they're shaped like a uh, measuring tape. All of you have seen a measuring tape, which the tailor uses to measure you. 
before they take your uh, before, they, before they make you dresses or anything so those are tapeworms or cestodes they'll be exactly they'll be flat and they'll be very long so those are cestodes so trematodes and cestodes are two types of platyhelminths or flat worms okay whereas nematelmins these are basically nematodes okay these are round worms these are round so that is why these are round worms they look like earthworms okay so that is the basic difference in between these two things so one is platyhelminths one is nematelmins nematelmins are basically these are nematodes these are round worms whereas platyhelminths are flat worms and these flat worms are basically of two types one is leaf shaped trematodes or flukes and these are also cestodes that is tapeworms that is basically they are shaped like a measuring tape okay so what are the general characters of cestodes basically because we are discussing about cestodes today so we'll discuss about the general characters of cestodes so general characters is first thing is they are ribbon or tape shaped okay so measuring tape like they are so another thing is they have a rounded skull legs you can see that they have a head like thing that is the rounded skull legs which has appendages for attachment that is they attached either to the intestine or somewhere else so wherever they will attach they will have suck suckers or hooked rostella okay hook like things may be there so we'll move on to the pictures once we move on move in the class you'll see that they will have suckers or hooked rostella for attachment another is they have a neck where the growth actually starts and then the complete body is known as the strobilum which is composed of many segments it may be three segments up to 4000 segments or this each segment is known as a proglottid each segment is known as a proglottid so once you because these terms are little different try to remember the terms one thing is the scolex what is the scolex the scolex is the head like structure okay so it will attach to the intestine or wherever it will attach it will attach with the help of this scolex which will possess suckers or hooked rostella some will have hooks some will not have hooks for example tinea saginata does not have hooks it has only suckers whereas tinea solium is having hooks okay and then there is a neck and then there is the strobilum strobilum is the complete body part these are the uh, segments so many segments can be there or few segments also can be there we'll come to how different types of segments are there each segment is known as a proglottid each segment is known as a proglottid try to remember these terms so that you will be familiar once we are discussing in the class you will not think okay what is proglottid what is strobilum what is scolex if you are not able to understand then it will be difficult so basically three parts scolex neck and strobilum scolex neck and strobilum scolex is the head then there is the neck then there is the strobilum which is com composed of many proglottids there can be few or there can be many depending on the number of proglottids the length of the uh, cestode will vary okay so the length will vary between 3 mm to 10 meters up to 10 meters also it can grow you might have discussed in tinea chapter also madam might have told you that how many how many segments can be there it can be very very long from 5 to 10 meters also it can reach so this is the basic thing so here you can see this is the head the structure the scolex so this is the scolex structure here you can see the suckers these parts are the suckers so you can see by negative pressure uh, they can attach to the surface of the inter intestine so these are the suckers whereas here you can see the hooks these are the hooked things okay so with the help of the hooks also it can attach these are the suckers this is the hook so this is the scolex part then there is the neck part this is the neck part and then all these are the proglottids this is in the the strobilum that is the entire body is composed of many many proglottids so each one here you can see the the tape like thing is having so many segments so here you can see each segment one 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 segment these segments are known as the proglottids okay so here you can see this is the scolex so this is tinea saginata scolex you can see there are only the suckers okay only the suckers here you cannot see the hooks whereas here in tinea solium you can see there are the hooks okay this is the hook rostella okay so there's those are the hooks so here you can see these are the hooks these are the suckers this entire thing is the scolex which includes the hooks and suckers then there is the neck and then there are the proglottids okay these are the different parts of the cestodes okay so all these cestodes are basically hermaphrodites that is in each segment in each proglottid the male and female reproductive organs are present okay 
so that is why you can you can find when we go to the segments you can see that each segment will contain the male and female reproductive system okay so these are all hermaphrodites there is no body cavity you can see that in nematodes there will be a body cavity but here in cestodes there is no body cavity there is no digestive tract okay and there is no vascular system so this is basically a uh, cestode here you can see this is the scolex this is the neck part then so many proglottids are present so these are the segments so once you cut open each segment you can see all the male and female reproductive organs are present and basically there is no uh, body cavity because each thing is separate each thing is independent okay so each proglottid is independent in itself just a little go on elonging from here and then uh, from immature it will go into mature into gravid segments what do you mean by gravid it will contain the eggs okay so these are the immature segments these are the immature segments these immature segments slowly go, grow into the mature segments then slowly they will grow into the uh, gravid segments okay so here you can see in each segment here you can see that uh, all the organs male and female reproductive organs are present so here you can see the, the testes the uterus the vas deferens vagina ovary everything is present in each segment okay so here you can see how long it can be can you see how long it is so the adult worms live in the small intestine of their definitive host so once we come to echinococcus you will understand that the definitive host of echinococcus is the dog okay in the dog intestine the echinococcus uh, granulosus will be present and the larval stage is found in the intermediate host in case of echinococcus the intermediate host is man okay so where we'll find the hydatid cyst okay so this is the adult worm here you can see how long it is from here starting from here so many segments are there it will go grow into the immature mature and gravid segments okay the eggs are the diagnostic stage but it is very difficult to differentiate between the tinea eggs even echinococcus eggs look similar okay these are spherical with a shell and they have embryonic membranes for embryo protection and this oncosphere that is the egg inside here you can see some elongated hooks are present small 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 pairs three pairs of hooks are present inside this uh, oncosphere the three pairs of hooks are present okay so severe and sometimes fatal symptoms may also occur due to the presence of the larval stage in the host for example in tinea solium in echinococcus granulosus where the larval stage can be present in man so just now in the video you saw about cysticercosis so cysticercosis is the larval stage of tinea solium so larval stage of tinea solium is how it is like the it can be present in the brain it can be present in very uh, critical places where if you will have a cyst then it will be a, a, a lesion one lesion uh, that uh, space occupying lesion can be formed inside the brain or any vital organ so that is a very dangerous state to be present so even echinococcus granulosus can form the hydatid cyst so that hydatid cyst will be present in man so that is why it is a dangerous stage okay so a little bit uh, we'll recap about tinea solium and saginata already you know so that is why we'll discuss a little bit about tinea solium and saginata then we'll move on to echinococcus granulosus and hemolepis nana only the important points we'll discuss please read your parasitology textbooks today itself so that you can understand okay so tinea solium and saginata basically the difference is solium is fork tapeworm whereas saginata is beef tapeworm how i used to remember is g is for guy here guy means uh, beef yes uh, cow so basically so this is the beef tapeworm whereas this is solium is the pork tapeworm and both are present worldwide okay so here you can see the life cycle basically what is the life cycle tinea solium or saginata whatever it is is the eggs will be uh, the uh, the uh, humans will be infected by uh, ingesting raw or undercooked infected meat so may may it be beef or undercooked pork or whatever it is known as measly pork so once they eat it what will happen is the larval stage the oncospheres can be ingested by man so once the oncospheres uh, the the uh, uh, in the cysticercae so the cysticercae will be uh, the larval stages if they are ingested that larval stage will grow into the adult stage in the human intestine so in the human intestine it will grow into the adult stage and each uh, uh, you you know that each proglottid it will grow into the gravid stages and it will give rise to the eggs so once the eggs are there so the, these eggs can be ingested by the cattle or by the once uh, if there is no proper sanitation by pigs they will ingest and the oncospheres the, they will hatch and they will form the in the muscles of the pig or in the muscles of the cow 
they will go and they will form the larval stages so if they are not properly cooked the meat of cow or the meat of uh, this pork so that if uh, the human ingests so what will happen is again the cycle will go on but one extra thing is present in tinea solium is what will happen is sometimes the eggs themselves from the uh, intestine they can go into the body of man and they can form the larval stages in man also so that is one important point you have to remember so one thing is only in tinea saginata only the adult stage will be present in man but in tinea solium the larval stage can also be present in man so that is known as cysticercosis that is known as cysticercosis okay so here you can see the diagnostic stage in the case of cysticercosis here you can see this the infected stage is the mm, infective stage is the uh, the measly pork or whatever will contain the larva so that larva basically these are cyst like structures so once they are ingested by man they will uh, move on to move on to the uh, intestines and the adults will form and they will give rise to the eggs everything will form so one extra thing which is there in case of tinea solium which i told you in the case of man also the eggs can hatch and they can go on to the brain or other structures of man and they can cause cysticercosis in man so the cysts or the larval stages can also be present in man in the case of tinea solium okay remember this extra thing okay so this is the extra thing here you can see that if you take undercooked or uncooked pork by uh, human beings if you take then the adult will come into the intestine and then the uh, again the eggs will go out and then once the eggs are ingested by the pig then it will hatch and it will re be released and it will form the uh, cyst cyst so in the muscles of the pig okay but one extra thing is in the case of man also that same egg can move on to different organs and can cause cysticercosis okay so uh, what is happening is in the proglottids you can see that the tinea solium the proglottids are shorter than that of tinea saginata whereas a hooked scolex is present in the case of tinea solium the hooked scolex is as absent only the suckers are present and the uterine branches are lower in number in case of tinea solium as compared to tinea saginata here you can see the number of branches in tinea solium is less as compared to tinea saginata in tinea saginata the uterine branches are more one more thing is there are no hooks in case of tinea saginata whereas the hook rostellum is present in the case of tinea solium okay so this is the tinea egg basically you cannot differentiate between the eggs of tinea solium and tinea saginata if you see under the microscope okay this is these are the proglottids okay so there it will cause abdominal discomfort intestinal irritations all those will be there and you can see how gross they are so what is cysticercosis if the larval development occurs within 2 months it will give rise to a fluid filled bladder like thing which is having an arms collex which is basically a cysticercus and these tinea solium eggs can be ingested by the human or even inside if the human is already infected auto infection can occur and they will hatch in the intestine they can penetrate the mucosa and enter the blood circulation they can be resident in the liver skeletal muscles brain eye so cyst cysticercosis can be present in all these organs so in the liver in the skeletal muscles in the brain or even in the eye so here you can see this is the cysticercus here you can see a bladder like structure is present it is surrounded by a fibrous capsule which contains an invaginated scolex it is a bladder like fluid filled cyst and multiple uh, cysts can be present about 0.5 to 2 m 2 cm in size in the humans so the patient with tinnitus is the source basically auto infection can occur hot hetero infection can occur so susceptible population is especially more in adults but all ages can be infected so this is basically the same life cycle of cysticercosis okay so you can see the symptoms of cysticercosis are harsh here you can see the in the brain so many cysts are present in the brain so many cysts are present here in the eye also the cyst is present so the muscle suppose it is present in the muscle it can cause fever swelling atrophy or fibrosis in the brain it will cause neurocysticercosis which is a very dangerous situation so epilepsy ataxic gait or mental confusion can occur so here you can see neurocysticercosis okay so these are the cysticerci here you can see the cyst in the brain okay so here you can see in the skeletal muscles also how many cysticerci are present okay many are present so you can do a ct scan and mri scan or a fundoscopic examination for the eye 
and here you can see the so gravid segments so just now we were talking about the different segments so these are the gravid segments showing the male and female reproductive organs of the uh, proglottids okay so here you can see different types of proglottids these are the immature proglottids which just arise from the scolex and the neck downward so these are the immature proglottids these are the mature proglottids these are the gravid proglottids the gravid proglottids will give rise to the eggs okay so here you can see this is the gravid segment this is the mature segment how much difference is there here the uterine branches are much more clearly visible okay so this is tinea solium here you can see the hooked scolex so hooked rostellum nicely you can see and these are the suckers okay this is for attachment so here you can see the same thing so suckers and the hooked rostellum okay so the uterine branches are less in tinea solium as compared to tinea saginata tinea solium is having only 7 to 13 branches whereas tinea saginata is having 15 to 20 branches okay so here you can see the tinea eggs basically you cannot differentiate between the tinea eggs of tinea solium and tinea saginata so it infects and kills even a lot of people you can see many places where the sanitation conditions are less so in those places it is uh, bound to affect more okay now we'll discuss a little bit about echinococcus granulosus this is a very small this is not that long as compared to tinea solium and saginata it is having only three segments here you can see so we'll move on to the details so of echinococcus granulosus okay also known as the dog tapeworm also known as the dog tapeworm so basically it belongs to the same family tinea da and currently recognized many species are there but basically we'll concentrate on echinococcus granulosus we'll concentrate on echinococcus granulosus so echinococcus basically causes hydatid disease there are four important species of echinococcus which infects humans like echinococcus granulosus which causes cystic hydatid disease echinococcus multilocularis which causes alveolar hydatid disease echinococcus bogeli and oligarthus which cause polycystic hydatid disease but basically we'll concentrate on echinococcus granulosus okay it is also known as the dog tapeworm please remember Remember, in viva also they can ask you what is the alternate name for echinococcus granulosus please remember it is also known as the dog tapeworm or the hydatid worm which belongs to cestodes and it causes cystic echinococcus or hydatid disease in livestock and human beings which acts as a intermediate host so this is the difference here basically dog is the definitive host whereas humans are the intermediate hosts okay it is a zoonotic disease okay if they, if you give they, if they give a question that uh, list list out some zoonotic diseases here there you can write about echinococcus okay geographically it is present in many parts of the world it is more extensive in the sheep and cattle raising areas of australia africa and south america it is also found in europe china middle east and india and is seen more often in temperate rather than tropical regions okay the definitive hosts are canines that is dogs wolves also cats and sometimes the intermediate host basically man is a accidental host actually actually it, uh, when we discuss in parasitology it is a dead end host but human will act when the hydatid cyst is present in human he will be the intermediate host but the herbivores actual the intermediate hosts are sheep deer goats so those uh, herbivorous animals okay so here you can see that it is the smallest cestode it is a very small cestode only three proglottids are present immature mature and gravid okay so only three segments or three proglottids are present okay so here you can see the scolex is showing hooks here you can see the hooks are present in this echinococcus granulosus this is the immature segment this is the immature segment this is the uh, here you can see the embryonated egg slowly it is maturing slowly it is maturing here you can see this is the oncosphere this is the oncosphere okay so this is the egg here you can see three pairs it is also similar to the tinea eggs basically there is an outer shell and an inner shell so radially striated embryo pore is present and the onco oncosphere inside it will contain three pairs of hooklets three pairs of hook hooklets will be present so basically it is known as the dog tapeworm or the hydatid tapeworm and it is found basically in the mediterranean region because they are sheep rearing areas so the disease caused is echinococcus or unilocular hydatid cyst so scolex is containing four suckers and a double cr hook crowned rostellum so the rest of the body consists of three proglottids and gives the length of about 2.5 to 9 mm at most 
okay so this is the life cycle basically the definitive host is the dog so once the dog will uh, give rise to the uh, the in the, inside the dog you can see that the immature forms will be present then they will grow into the adult forms once the dog will ingest just cyst so dogs will eat suppose uh, sheep meat or other meat once they will canines not only dogs canines will eat the cyst which is present in the uh, sheep or other herbivorous animals so once they will eat sorry once they will eat then what will happen is this uh, it will grow into the adult so one each cyst can contain actually many okay each each will contain many daughter cysts many scolesis so it will grow into the adult in the dog and in the dog feces actually the eggs will be passed in the dog feces the eggs will be passed which will be ingested suppose uh, the feces are there on grass or anything else so the sheep will ingest the eggs and in the sheep the hydrated disease uh, hydrated cyst will develop so in man also the man is an accidental host if he is handling dogs or suppose uh, the dog is containing in, on the dog fur also the eggs may be present if uh, the sanitary conditions are not that good then human hydrated will be present okay so basically the definitive host you can see echinococcus granulosus the definitive hosts are dogs coyotes wolves etc but in multilocularis it is mostly foxes okay. here you can see there are only three segments it is the scolex then there is the neck then there is the immature the mature and the gravid segment so intermediate host basically it is sheep horses camels pigs and humans for echinococcus granulosus whereas for multilocularis it is small rodents if you want you can remember otherwise you cannot you may not remember but you have to remember that basically the intermediate hosts of echinococcus granulosus are sheep horses camels etc so what are the layers of the hydrated cyst because hydrated cyst can be a question it is always asked in viva we have a hydrated cyst in our lab so that is why they will ask you in spotters they will ask you in viva so that is why you have to talk about the layers of the hydrated cyst you have to remember about echinococcus granulosus the life cycle everything at the same time you have to remember about the layers of the hydrated cyst so hydrated cyst is containing basically the pericyst or the adventitia that is the outermost layer then there is the endocyst or the laminated layer and innermost one is the germinal layer the germinal layer will produce a clear fluid which contains a pressure of about 300 mm of water keeping the endocyst in intimate contact with the pericyst the endocyst receives its sustenance from the pericyst okay so this is the unilocular hydrated cyst here you can see this is the hydrated cyst okay basically this is the life cycle you have uh, already seen so the dog is the definitive host so the dog will contain the adult in the small intestine and once he'll pass the stool and the embryonated eggs are embryonated eggs are present in the feces so it will be ingested by the intermediate host that is sheep and other herbivores so the hydrated cyst will be developing in the sheep human is an accidental host sometimes and in human the eggs will develop into the hydrated cyst in different different areas so here you can see in different organs they can develop into the hydrated cyst and that is why it is a dangerous situation to be in okay so in the liver in the lungs etc the hydrated cyst can be present so here you can see the echinococcus cyst in the feces of dog here you can see in the feces of dog the echinococcus eggs are present so this is the cyst structure just now we were talking about it so basically there is a collagen layer or adventitial layer outside it is a very tough layer so this type of thing actually we have in our laboratory in a big uh, jar of formalin we have this sort of hydrated cyst so what what you will see is basically the outermost layer but then there will be an inner layer where the, the this is pink one is the germinal layer and from the germinal layer the brood capsules many many protoscolices colices will be present all in the hydrated cyst a fluid will be present hydrated fluid and in the hydrated fluid also some some uh, small small granular things hydrated sand can be present okay so hydrated sand will basically contain the hooks the little little bit of scolices so all those things will be present in the hydrated fluid this hydrated fluid is actually it is very very uh, prone to cause hypersensitivity so when you are operating also once the doctor is operating in the liver or somewhere it is present they have to be very careful that they do not rupture the hydrated cyst 
if they rupture it then this contents will all go into the uh, peritoneal cavity or whatever cavity it will go into and it will cause a severe hypersensitivity reaction so that is why once the doctor is operating he has to be very very careful okay so here you can see these are the daughter cysts okay the daughter cyst inside one cyst another cyst also can be present so these are the protoscolices so this is the germinal layer so this is basically of uh, parasitic origin the germinal layer will give rise to the uh, the germinal layer will give rise to the protoscolices the daughter cyst etc and the fib fibrous type of Okay, thing will be there outside it, it is actually the host origin and it will it will try it will the host will basically try to confine that thing so that is why that thing will be present so here you can see so many hydrated cysts so these are all the hydrated cysts during surgery they are taking out the hydrated cyst very carefully so hydrated cyst they are taking out very carefully otherwise if it ruptures it will cause hypersensitivity reaction so this is hydrated sand so in the hydrated fluid i told you that many protos colises all the hooks hooklets will be present inside that so it is known as hydrated sand okay this hydrated sand basically once you take out the hydrated cyst you can take out the hydrated fluid you can take the hydrated sand and you can put it under the microscope to see these protoscolices okay so that is the thing so these are the protoscolices here you can see the protoscolices so each one basically can grow into an adult okay each one basically can grow into an adult so you can think of how many numbers of echinococci echinococcus granulosus can form so here they are so operating so they are taking out so in many places where they can be present here it is present in the lungs in the abdomen it can be present so here you can see in an ultrasound scan in a hepatic echinococcal cyst you can see the hydrated sand here it is present in the eye so it is very very dangerous so this is also in the liver in the liver you can see the hydrated cyst okay so now we'll discuss a little bit about hymenolepis nana so hymenolepis nana is a very small thread like 2 to 3 cm in length it is also a cestode it contains of over 100 segments all of which are broader than long these are more broad here you can see they are not very long but they are broader okay so hymenolepis nana remember the alternate names it is also known as the dwarf tapeworm nanos means dwarf okay hymenolepis nana is the most common tapeworm in humans worldwide so the hymenolepis diminuta is another hymenolepis which is present so hydro hydro uterine branches are hardly visible and each segment is about 1 mm wide so hymenolepis nana each uh, the eggs will be there which will be ne nearly 30 to 47 microns in diameter and at both ends here you can see in this picture it is clearer at both ends actually some polar filaments will be present in both ends polar filaments will be present these uh, dot 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 uh, filament like structures which you can see they are at the both poles okay they lie between the egg shell and the oncosphere okay this is the oncosphere the outer one is the egg shell so in between them there will be the polar filament so that is how you can differentiate between the morphology of hymenolepis nana eggs okay so this is the mature segment then the gravid segment of hymenolepis nana so by accidentally ingesting the eggs so contamin fecally contaminated foods or water touching mouth with contaminated fingers contaminated soil so hymenolepis nana infection can occur so light infections with hymenolepis nana are asymptomatic but abdominal pain diarrhea headache non specific symptoms can be there even due to hymenolepis diminuta in humans same type of thing can be there if there is prolonged diarrhea then dehydration can occur okay so this is the hymenolepis nana scolex here so here you can see the suckers here you can see the suckers okay but uh, that armed rostellum this is the armed rostellum this is this is these are the hooklets so these things are present okay so now one of you uh, can you just uh, summarize what we have discussed anybody anyone who can summarize what we have discussed just in short whatever you remember it might not be everything hello nilima 105 roll number nilima yes ma'am yes unmute yourself and tell whatever you remember you tell i can i can no corpus granulosus causes hydatid cyst yes yes anything else cestodes what did we discuss about cestodes cestodes basically look like what tape tape worms why are they called as tape worms 
there like a measuring tape very good they look like measuring tape they are flat and they are long okay so that is why those are known as tape worms okay what are the other types of platyhelminths that uh, we discussed in the video trematodes. leaf like thing trematode so leaf like things are trematodes what are round worms nematode nematodes very good so once you know these three what is the basic difference and you know the general characters of each why did i go to the general characters of uh, tape worms because once you know the general characters you can put it into anything you can put it suppose question comes uh, tinea you can put it there if the question comes as uh, echinococcus you can put it there if the question comes as hymenolepis you can put it there so once you know the general characters of each worm it will be very very easy for you to write okay now nilima tell me what what else did we discuss about echinococcus echinococcus primary host yes the definitive host definitive Top. host means what definitive host means what tell me the definitive host means where the adult form will live or where the sexual stage will be there in parasites that is the definitive host okay so because the adult stage is there in the dog that is why the definitive host is dog whereas in the case of tinea solium and tinea saginata which is the definitive host tinea saginata tinea saginata and solium the definitive host is man whereas the intermediate hmm. host is cow or pig okay cow and did you understand pig. now yes now did you understand yes. the difference between high definitive yes. host and others definitive host and intermediate host in the case of echinococcus granulosus man is what type of host accidental host accidental host but also if the uh, larval stage that is the hydatid cyst is present man is also an intermediate host okay did you understand now yes ma'am basically there are two types of host why we talked about accidental host because man is actually not every time the reservoir man is accidentally infected okay but basically if the hydatid cyst is present in man man is the intermediate host okay now did you understand Yes, ma'am. Okay. What are the different types? So, what are the different body parts of the cestodes? Can you tell? Scolex. Very good. Ne the scolex will ne contain what? Ro hooked rostrum. Yes, hooked rostrum may or may not be present. At the same time, suckers will be present. Suckers. Yes. Suckers will be present. Then, what is the next part? Head. Head neck. is the scolex. Head is the scolex. Then there is the neck, and next mm -hmm. the entire body Segment. is the strobula. The strobula. The segments mm -hmm. are the proglottids. The segments are the <coughs> proglottids. Now, did you understand? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. So, in the case of Echinococcus, it is a very small dog tapeworm. Why? Because segments are how many? Hundred nearly. No, no. In the case of Echinococcus, in the case of dog tapeworm. In the case of dog tapeworm, the number is very less. Three segments. I'll show you. Only three, three segments. segments. Only three segments. Why three segments? Only the immature, mature, and the mature. gravid segments and will be present. Okay. So only the immature, mature, and gravid segments will be present in the case of the Echinococcus granulosus. Here you can see. In the screen, can you see? Can you see? Yes, ma'am. This is the scolex. Then there will be the neck. Then the, these are the three segments. Only three segments: immature, mature, and gravid segments are present. Not many yeah. segments. Okay. I hope others also understood basic things. Did everybody understand? Yes. If you cannot understand anything, also you can give feedback. No problem. If you are having trouble in listening or trouble in uh, following, or if I am going fast or anything, you can just give feedback. And again, I will repeat any part which you want. Okay. Anybody is having problems means please let me know. Okay, just I'll summarize. Can I go to slides? Just one, one, one thing, one, one thing I'll show. Okay. So this is the Echinococcus granulosus worm. Okay. So it is having only three segments. So this belongs to family Tinea DA. Many species are there, but we basically discussed about Echinococcus granulosus, and they cause uh, disease in humans, different types of disease. But we are interested in only the cystic hydatid disease. Okay, it is also known as the dog tapeworm. It is prevalent in many areas, but especially in the sheep and cattle raising areas. And the definitive hosts are the dogs or wolves or uh, other uh, 
canine animals whereas the intermediate host basically are the sheep deer goats etc man whenever the hydatid cyst is present in man man will be the intermediate host but man is accidentally infected okay so this is the smallest cystode composed only of three segments only of three proglottids this is the scollex which is showing the hooks and the suckers so here you can see the immature proglottid so it's slowly it will give rise to the eggs so this is the so you can see this is the egg so this is egg will contain exactly like tinea egg it will look it will have a, a radially restricted embryo pore and inside there will be the oncosphere the oncosphere will contain three pairs of hooklets three pairs of hooklets so it is exactly the same as compared to uh, the tinea egg okay so it is uh, the scollex has four suckers and a double crowned horostellum so it the definitive host is a dog and in the dog it will grow into the adult stage and the adult stage will give rise to the eggs that egg can be ingested by man or it can be ingested by sheep so in the case of sheep it will grow into the uh, hydatid cyst in the case of man also in different organs that hydatid cyst can form and what will happen is because man will not be eaten by dogs but this can these herbivorous animals can be eaten by dogs wolves etc and once they are eaten up each each uh, you can see so many different daughter uh, scolices are present so each daughter scolice will grow into the adult will grow into the adult in the case of dog okay so these are the definitive hosts in the case of echinococcus granulosus dogs coyotes wolves other canine animals and this is the worm it is very small as compared to other like other cystodes like tinea and you can see that sheep horses camels pigs so these are the also the humans are the intermediate host please remember humans are accidental host at the same time they are intermediate host because the hydatid cyst only can be present in man not the adult worm remember the adult worm is not present in man okay so the different layers of the hydatid cyst there is the per pericyst or the adventitia or the endocyst and then there is the germinal layer this is the hydatid cyst okay so this is the echinococcus eggs in the feces and this is the hydatid cyst you can here you can see the innermost pink color germinal layer so so many protoscolices can be present inside so each one will give rise to one one adult so you have to take it out very carefully once you are doing surgery if you rupture it what will happen is the hydatid fluid along with the hydatid sand and everything it will go into the peritoneum or wherever you are operating and it will cause a hypersensitivity reaction so that is why you have to be very very careful so this is the germinal layer it is containing so many daughter cysts can you see so many daughter cysts are present so many protoscolices daughter cysts are present so these are the hydatid cysts okay these are this is hydatid sand once you put it under the microscope you can see so many protoscolices all these hooklets can you see inside the hooklets are present the hooklets are present okay so these here you can see very clearly the hooklets okay the hooklets are present this is basically the protoscolices that is it will grow into the scollex slowly slowly it will elongate into the adult worm so he, this is the hydatid uh, cyst it can be present in many organs in the liver in the lungs yes in the liver in the lungs in the eyes also it can be present so hymenolepis nana little bit only we discussed i hope everybody understood what we were basically discussing today okay and uh, uh, all the best for your examinations next month please read thoroughly systematic bacteriology is little confusing write down all the important points so whatever important points are there starting from introduction one or two points will be there then there will be important points in the morphology of the bacterium then there will be some points in the cultural characters in the biochemical features then the pathogenesis then once you know the pathogenesis you can know about the clinical features and then once you know the clinical features you can come to the diagnosis what samples are to be collected what, what do you do with those samples what are the different modalities of diagnosis and then a little bit about treatment okay go about very very carefully and read very thoroughly make your own notes rough notes you make so that you can remember because systemic bacteriology is a little bit confusing the cocci bacilli so many features will be so much similar so that is why first try to remember whether it is gram positive whether it is gram negative what type of organism it is what type of disease it causes whether or not it produces a toxin so all those things please remember and please remember the typical culture media okay in each chapter there will be a typical thing each chapter will have this particular culture media is typical this is selective medium this is this thing so all those things you have to remember and write down in the exam okay i hope everybody understood today's uh, class and please uh, read a little bit because these chapters parasitology chapters are actually very short you can finish it in 15 minutes if you have 
listen to the class okay thank you everyone now i'll uh, close the meeting